My name is Max Gagliardi, and you're listening to the Talk Energy Podcast. If you're watching this video, take a moment, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app, leave a review, help me out. This episode's guest is Jason Less, the CEO of Riot Blockchain, one of the largest publicly traded Bitcoin mining companies in the US. Using disadvantaged energy located in rural West Texas, Riot's currently building out their Windstone facility, which when complete, will be one of the largest Bitcoin mining sites in the world. And when I look at the pictures of Riot's Windstone operations, I can't help but feel that it's a testament to the strength of the Bitcoin network. This episode is filled with discussions about the Windstone facility and the challenges that are involved with building out a brownfield Bitcoin mining site. We talk about Riot's advocacy efforts and what they're doing at the national and local level to help legislators better understand Bitcoin. And lastly, we discuss some of the technical sides of scaled Bitcoin mining, the future of Bitcoin hardware efficiencies, and how proof of work is more than just consuming power. It's the cumulative amount of human effort involved to build out the most resilient network that's ever been created. Hope you enjoy the show. Jason, welcome to Talk Energy. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Max. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know we uh, we met the other day, and I thought you know, I thought uh, this is technically an energy podcast, but I've been doing a ton of Bitcoin content because the two worlds have collided, and I uh, mm-hmm. can't really escape it. And so, uh, Tristine and I had talked and working on some of the Bitcoin advocacy stuff, and I got a chance to meet you the other day, and I'm, I really I really do appreciate that uh, you're taking the time to come on. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, Bitcoin mining and energy becoming more and more intertwined, especially in Texas, which which I know we're going to talk about. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I think definitely makes sense for the Talk Energy podcast. Yeah, absolutely. People are joking with me all the time. They're like, you're basically just a Bitcoin podcast now. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like what can I say? Uh, well, maybe that's a sign of things to come <laughs> in the industry. It is. No, it is. Yeah. And I've, we've been talking about it. I've been about a year kind of in the doing some things in the Bitcoin space. And I've been telling all my, I'm mostly been natural gas and oil and gas, uh, some energy stuff, uh, broader energy markets, but I've been telling all my friends and colleagues that this is coming. And I think at this point that they just can't, it's undeniable. I mean, basically a year ago, they kind of looked at me weird, but at this point, everybody now is trying to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, it, it's such a useful tool to, to energy generators, to energy grids. Um, Bitcoin mining has, has so many advantages uh, because of its flexibility because of how agnostic it is to the time of day or location that it's operating at. So uh, yeah, work works very well at the energy market and um, very excited to see how this has been developing. For sure. So some of the people, because they're, you know, maybe more on the energy side of things may not know the about Riot. So uh, just a quick overview of the company, just for people that may not know. Sure. I'll kind of go, go to a brief history here. Uh, Riot started uh, at the end of 2017, uh, trading on NASDAQ as a Bitcoin blockchain focused company, was, was mining Bitcoin very early on, but uh, was focused on another of other initiatives at its inception. Then over time, the co- company went through this transformation and narrowed in its focus on specifically Bitcoin and specifically Bitcoin mining. If you're an efficient operator, Bitcoin mining is an ideal tool to use to accumulate Bitcoin. Right. Uh, you're, if your your costs are competitive, you're essentially kind of dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin over time as a result of your mining operations. So we're believers in Bitcoin. We want to support Bitcoin and we want to accumulate Bitcoin. So mining is what we just started focusing all of our resources on. Yeah. Going back to 2019, we started uh, accumulating more and more uh, orders of Bitcoin mining hardware from the uh, industry's leading manufacturer, Bitmain. We started deploying those miners and um, ordering more and more, increasing our fleet, increasing our expected future hash rate, hash rate being a measurement of a Bitcoin miner's power. And then in uh, May of this year, we closed the acquisition of a company called Winstone US. Winstone is the single largest Bitcoin mining facility as measured by developed capacity in North America. That's 300 megawatts developed there with the ability to expand to 750 megawatts. So that is, um, that's located out in Rockdale, Texas. That is the crown jewel of Riot's operations uh, going forward. That's where the focus of our expansion is. We've started a 400 megawatt expansion project right after the acquisition closed. um, And that is underway. And uh, should be completed by the second quarter of 2022, which would take that site to 700 megawatts and make it the biggest Bitcoin mining facility in the world, as far as uh, I'm aware. That's incredible. So I'm kind of an infrastructure nerd, and I, my background is in a number of different infrastructure uh, stuff in the energy industry, mainly on the, like I mentioned, the natural gas side. But I just am fascinated with the technical aspects of a facility of that magnitude. Uh, just talk a little bit about what it takes to harness that much energy 
Uh, and maybe, you know, don't be afraid to talk technical of what, you know, just the undertaking to get a facility like that built, not only from the power side and the energy side, uh, but also just from the Bitcoin mining side. I mean, I'm running a single miner, uh, what's miner in my podcast studio that I just turned off and the heat that that thing puts off is just incredible. I mean, like I have to basically either open a door or run my AC uh, the entire time in here for one uh, miner. So just maybe talk about what it takes to get a facility like that up and going and all the technical and operational challenges. Yeah, th there's a lot that goes into it and, and really a lot more than people think. Um, I think people are very, I, I think as the industry is maturing, um, people are learning more about, about Bitcoin mining and people focus on the hardware component of the actual Bitcoin mining machines. And they, they know, okay, you got a lot of those running, you got a lot of hash rate, you're, um, you're, you're producing a lot of Bitcoin. But the infrastructure that supports that, getting that infrastructure, building it out is very critical. And it's part of the industry that I think gets less attention. And I think part of the reason of that is, is um, People have not built at this scale before. 300 megawatts, I talked about at Winston. No, no one's built a 300 megawatt facility in North America before in one location. Um, these Bitcoin miners in huge quantities use a lot of energy. And right. people have been buying miners lately, but no one has actually started building enough to house all these miners yet. This has kind of been a problem people have worried about down the, down the road. So we, we've been ahead of the curve, I think, on that front. And what's interesting about this Bitcoin mining stuff is there's no handbook on how to do this. No right. one's been doing this for decades. There's no you know, good resource here. How, here's how you build a 100 megawatt facility. It's really just the people that have done it, have built that uh, expertise through trial and error, which you know is, is the best way to learn anything. You try and you fail, you learn what doesn't work, you iterate and you move forward. And that's something that the Winstone team uh, is incredibly good at. They have, they've been doing this for a number of years now. They had a facility in uh, New Orleans before they started building out this facility in Rockdale, Texas. So they spent a lot of time learning, figuring out what works and what doesn't. You talked about the heat from your miner. That is a, a key area that differentiates Bitcoin mining from a lot of other data center applications. You have to, you, you know, a Bitcoin mining facility might not be as sexy as a tier four data center or something, but you really have to learn how to control that heat. And you don't have tools like HVAC that you do in a data center to do that kind of stuff because there's so much more heat. Um, HVAC just cannot control it. So it, it really comes down to effectively routing that air, taking an ambient air and getting that hot air out uh, without contaminating the, uh, the inside. So, there's a number of really interesting ways you can do that. And one of the ways the Winstone team did that was they, instead of relying on building fans all along the outside of the building, people have seen pictures of lots of Bitcoin mining buildings or containers sure. that are built. A lot of times people just are putting literally fans lining up the outside wall that is, that are, they're pulling air in and shooting that, ambient air and shooting that over the miners. They designed a perfectly engineered solution where actually the negative pressure from the Bitcoin miners is pulling the ambient air out and they're pulling it through a kind of evaporative cooling system that has water dripping down this honeycomb style thing. And the negative pressure alone is pulling a sufficient amount of cool air through to keep those miners cool and that hot air is then uh, expelled, exhausted out of the roof of the building. And it's that kind of stuff that you learn from, you know, you try the fans, you see the inefficiencies, the extra power use, those things break. It, it, it is a, uh, it's a really cool system they, they, they developed there through, like I said, trial and error. So that's, that, that's a big undertaking to figure out how to do, especially at large scale from the cooling component. As far as the energy and the power goes, um, you, it's a lot of energy that's being pulled in. They pull their energy at Winstone. They are right across the street from the Sandow uh, switchyard that pu pulls through about, I, I believe in total that switchyard is about five or six gigawatts in energy. Wow. It's the, I think the biggest switchyard in all of central Texas. And that, that is a real major hub for bringing energy through down to the Austin area. The site was formerly an Alcoa uh, aluminum smelting plant that also had a luminant uh, coal power plant on site as well. Those have since shut down, but they've shut down and this switch yard remains. And it, it has been, uh, there's not many other applications that would make sense to put out there uh, in this kind of remote area of Texas, Bitcoin mining works. So they're in there tapping 750 megawatts off that switch. And 
they have uh, procured, it's really an incredible amount of energy infrastructure that goes into this. Um, very difficult, especially right now, to get 100 megawatt uh, high voltage transformers for stepping down that voltage. And they have about seven transformers on site now. And then, you know, then there's just hundreds of medium voltage transformers, more switch gear and lines of wiring that, and cabling that you, that you can imagine. Yeah. They, they work with an electrical contractor uh, out there that is basically full time just working on that site. And um, it is, it's pretty incredible to go out there and see. You know, there's 150 employees, who knows how many contractors working out there all the time. It's a madhouse. It's incredible to see that kind of building going on. And whenever I take people there who, um, people with experience in energy are impressed by it. We had the ERCOT CEO out there a few weeks ago, and you know, he's like, this is awesome what you guys are doing. I understand what, 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 you, what, what you're talking about now when, when, when you say how this helps the grid. Uh, but you take Bitcoin guys out there, and a lot of people don't even know that this level and scope of infrastructure exists for Bitcoin mining yet. And you get some guys out there like, wow, I'm more bullish on Bitcoin than I was before. I had no idea that this level of industrial scale infrastructure was out there securing the Bitcoin network. Well, it's like to me, it's it's what proof of work is. I mean, people think about proof of work as just like this expenditure of the actual energy. But it's so much more than that. I mean, as somebody that's worked even just a year with, uh, you know, our companies helped miners procure energy. We've looked at uh, some of our existing clients, look at mining Bitcoin for themselves. The amount of logistics, planning, effort, thought, human manpower, um, everything that's, you know, just the supply chain, like you mentioned, I'm glad you hit on that with the transformers and everything else. I mean, it is not just this, uh, you got to buy an ASIC and plug it in. I mean, I guess it is if you put one in your garage, but uh, for the most part, this network is being underpinned by a level of proof of work. That, and when I think of it, I know that maybe that's not the technical definition of it. Um, but when I think of that term, I think of all those things you just described. And when you talk about being bullish, it's underpinning this network and it's being underpinned by a bunch of capitalists and groups like yourself that are putting that proof of work in. And when I think when you start to really think about all that, that makes you just be kind of in awe of this network that's being built out. Yeah, I completely agree. It's such a good point. The concept behind proof of work is, I think, so often misunderstood. A lot of times you hear um, critics talk about proof of work like it's some design inefficiency. They come up with some you know, creative math to say, oh, a Bitcoin transaction requires uh, more energy than a home uses in a year or something like that. Oh, it's so right. inefficient to do transactions. That's not how it's designed. Transactions in Bitcoin uh, contain no energy payload. There's no energy that's required. There's no substantial amount of energy that's required to make it work. The energy that Bitcoin uses through Bitcoin mining is for driving consensus and security of the network. People have to think like th this was the innovation that made Bitcoin possible. It solved the problem of how do you get people all over the world to agree reach consensus on a blockchain on what a valid ledger of transactions are without having to trust each other. That was a problem that had no solution in computer science that people were debating over for decades. And proof of work is what solved that. And you talked about all the capital, all the work, all the infrastructure that goes into supporting proof of work is what makes that consensus system possible and what makes it more robust against attack. If you wanted to attack Bitcoin, you would now need to have more dishonest hash rate and the infrastructure that supports that hash rate than the honest nodes on the network. And you would have to sustain that attack for enough of a long enough period of a time to, to, to actually cause um, damage to the network. A lot of times people talk about 51% attacks. They think you get 51% of hash rate and it's all over. That is not how it works. That gives you a probability of success on a single block. To sustain that attack, it is you need to just keep procuring energy and going forward, it's very expensive. So yes, you're right, this proof of work is a very important concept and it is what gives Bitcoin um, the properties it has that makes it valuable. Yeah, exactly. It, it almost, I don't wanna say it is Bitcoin, but it is very much the essence of you know solving the Byzantine's general problem. It's what, you know, it's the invention effectively. And that plus the, uh, the difficulty adjustment, I mean, there's some other nuances to it uh, that create this kind of elegant uh, system that has been built. But I just think that back to your point around the 51% attack and people really want to, you know, is, you know, you heard a lot about is China going to do something mm -hmm. like that? Or you hear all these 
conspiracy theories, I guess you could call them. And I just think people underestimate just the amount of, it's not just plugging in the machines. It's all these other things we talked about. And so that's really, it, there's just so much more there that people would have to do. And to your point, they would have to do it and, and actually probably lose money doing it uh, to then just, you know, attack the network. It just doesn't really make sense. It's like, it's, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's uh, at this stage in Bitcoin, I think that it is, uh, it's a stretch to think that that it, would happen. I, yeah, that, I think that the, the, the word that a lot of, um, you know, Bitcoin engineers would use is not impossible, but prohibitively costly. Right. You know, even if you're China, you don't have, if you're, the, if you're the Communist Party of China, you do not have unlimited free energy. You cannot just be taking all this energy away for, you know, days or months, weeks, months on end that you would need to sustain your attack. Right. And, um, you know, Bitcoin was designed with those type of attacks in mind. Bitcoin was designed with the expectation that it would be a success and it would need to resist the most sophisticated and um, well-capitalized attacks that you could think of, thinking major nation states. And yeah, proof of work helps drive that security. And, and you're, I, I agree with you. It is it, it is an, a foundation of what makes Bitcoin what it is. Sometimes I get questions of, what do you think about Bitcoin switching to proof of stake? Is that going to, no, it's, it's never going to happen. Like yeah. it's just, it's not going to happen because that's not Bitcoin. That would be something else. Yeah. It's like, what was it like 20, 30, how many years before Bitcoin that people tried to solve these problems and create a cryptocurrency that was uh, decentralized and then you know, Bitcoin does it, and then now all of a sudden there's like ten thousand or however many that say that they yeah. can do it better. Now, now there's ten thousand, and everyone <laughs> has a pitch of what somehow they're doing it better. Yeah, yeah it's funny how that works. Um, <laughs> so you know, the Texas is like the energy capital of the United States. Uh, some may argue the world. It's it's certainly got a, a huge energy infrastructure. I mean, ERCOT's kind of its own beast. It's a unique system. You've got the oil and gas industry there, which is what I'm pretty familiar with. And it makes a lot of sense that because of this energy in that state, that the state would embrace it. That doesn't mean that it just because it makes sense that it would embrace it uh, doesn't mean it, you know, that it will embrace it. But it looks like it is. I mean, if you look at it, just it's, it's been really impressive. I mean, even hearing what like Ted Cruz the other day, him talking about uh, Bitcoin, I was like kind of shocked at some of the things that he was saying, what the governor has been out there and saying. And uh, it seems like they're really embracing this. Uh, how is it, you know, what's your perspective on Texas and Bitcoin and how is it uh, operating in that state? Yeah, first and foremost, Texas is a very business friendly state. So take all the energy and government support of Bitcoin away. Just the, the fact that very that, that Texas is very accommodating and welcome to business, uh, minimum regulation and taxes uh, makes it an ideal place to do business. So that's kind of that foundation layer that, that makes Texas an ideal place to be launching your enterprise. Then, you know, ERCOT, the energy market that exists here. Um, obviously, you're aware, I'm sure most of your listeners are aware how unique ERCOT is and that it's this energy island that's this deregulated market. And that is what's driving, um, that's what drives low power prices in Texas. And that's what's helping, you know, foster all these different types of new generation projects in ERCOT. And that 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 deregulated market and that the volatility in that market is what is the opportunity for Bitcoin miners, especially when you have more and more renewable generation sources coming into Texas. Wind blows a lot at night, sun, sun signs during the day. Neither of those things are 24 seven and there's not always buyers of that energy. So Bitcoin miners, they come in and they're the buy, Bitcoin miners are the buyers of energy of last resort. They're right. out there searching for the cheapest power and you find that on congested areas of the grid or areas with underutilized um, generation. So that provides a stability to the grid and helps capitalize on generation projects because they know there is someone out there, a large load that is going to be buying power 24 seven, but with the unique characteristic of the, of being able to shut off when market right. conditions dictate it, we can shut off at any time. And the work we did before is not lost. I mean, m maybe, you know, on, on a few minutes of work, I mean, in inconsequential amount, right? It's not like a traditional data center where, they can't shut down. They require 24-7 applications for whatever cloud computing application they're supporting or, or whatever. They, they go to great lengths to have, you know, total redundancy. Bitcoin miners have that flexibility. So you combine that flexibility with that base load characteristic, and you have a real stabilizing force to the energy grid that has 
the flexibility to um, to respond to events and make that grid stronger. So I think that's what Texas sees. I think that's what regulators see. I think that's what people who run the energy markets generation uh, sources themselves see. And that's what's making Texas such an accommodating home for Bitcoin mining. And I, I think uh, w with those characteristics and with the type of government support you're seeing for Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining in Texas, Texas is going to become the Bitcoin mining capital of the world. China will be a distant memory in five years when Texas is built out, built out with all these plans that are currently underway. You hit on a really important thing that I don't think, a really important topic that I don't think most people think through. And it's taken me some time as I've understood Bitcoin and the mining and how it can uh, work in this function. But what you're really saying is that it's kind of incentivizing, um, I don't want to say excess baseload, but it's incentivizing baseload or robust base mo baseload is maybe a better uh, way to put it. And, you know, when you look at these renewables and, you know, introducing wind or introducing solar, uh, there's intermittency that comes with that. And so there may be periods of time where you have excess energy because, you know, the sun's shining brighter, the wind's blowing hard, and that would then reduce the need uh, for baseload or for this base level of energy for those that don't know, maybe in the Bitcoin side. And so when that happens, I'm sure some of these uh, projects or these power plants that are providing that baseload, uh, like to your point, they don't have that consistent out, you know, customer that can come in that can buy that energy. And so by having Bitcoin mining, supporting and underpinning a very strong demand source for that baseload, it actually incentivizes more and gives you a more robust bottom layer to the energy grid. And then for, therefore, when there are times when that intermittency uh, switches from on to off, you then ha have the ability to shut down uh, for very short periods of time. And I've even seen it with like a Bitcoin miner at my home, you can unplug it for a podcast, plug it back in, and it's back up and it gets going pretty quick. And so this is like a really interesting aspect to it. Some people have called them like a battery almost. I don't know if that's a perfect analogy, but it does soak up energy and turn it into a value uh, that you can otherwise use. And it's just, it's if you really think about it, it's pretty incredible. You know, what, one phrase is kind of similar to battery that we often use to describe it. We talk about Windstone as a virtual power plant and we don't generate power but we have secured a long-term power purchase agreement. So we own that power. And by virtue of Windstone purchasing that originally, that created a predictable, um, that, a predictable demand for whatever generator utility uh, over a period of many years. And that, that is that, like you talked about, that created that incentive structure to have uh, generation sources for, for baseload and because we took the risk on take or paying that energy for so long, we now own that energy and we use that for Bitcoin mining and we sell that back to the grid uh, when the grid needs. And sometimes it's not even selling, sometimes it's just shutting down and making that power available without compensation. So uh, that, that I, I mentioned that to say that you know, that's how we kind of think about it sometimes. Virtual power plant. We don't purchase the power, but we, we don't generate the power, but we purchased it and we own it and we participate in the market with that power. That's a great way to put it. Uh, so we talked about Texas, um, you know, embracing this and it seems like it's pretty obvious and it, there's a lot of good reasons why, but just in general, some the way that I met you is through, you know, Riot looking at maybe doing some more advocacy type efforts to help either educate or show uh, whether that be other states, whether that be uh, at the federal level. I don't know everything that you guys are looking to do and it's you and others, not just you, but speak a little bit just to that and uh, kind of the vision there and what you guys think needs to be done to help get people up to speed and get people a better understanding uh, of what all the Bitcoin mining can do. Yeah, you know, I, I think everyone's eyes got opened in a big way with the amendment to the infrastructure bill dating back kind of a couple months ago now. And all of a sudden people realized, hey, this is a real national issue and there's legislation being thrown around that can really affect this industry. So I think that perked up everyone's attention, perked up our attention, realizing there needs to be advocacy efforts out there. And we want those efforts focused on supporting Bitcoin. Sometimes the, the advocacy efforts are working on a number of different types of cryptocurrencies or blockchains. And the, 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 the argument becomes like a bit diluted, it becomes a bit more complicated when, you, when you're trying to basically, you know, you're focused on Bitcoin and the transformational effects Bitcoin has but you're kind of lumped in with these other projects that you kind of don't feel too, too nice about being around. So we right. saw the need to have a Bitcoin focused advocacy group out there helping to educate the public, especially lawmakers on the local, state and national level on what Bitcoin is, 
what Bitcoin mining is and why this is such an, uh, such an advantage, such a positive impact on society. So Riot, it's not Riot's thing, but it's, it's an advocacy group called the uh, Sat Center and it's uh, Riot and a number of other Bitcoin companies as kind of the, the uh, founding uh, organizations here to get this off the ground. And then we will be able to take in more organizations to be a part of this. And we wanna be out there. We want to be dispelling a lot of the myths that you hear about Bitcoin. It, it is so troubling sometimes to hear these, to, to watch these committee hearings uh, listen to lawmakers talk about Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, and you're just like, I can't. Who, yeah. Who's telling you these things? Like, yeah. it, it, the, the information is just is so flawed. Sometimes you almost think it's intentionally they're being intentionally fed deceptive information. So you know, as Bitcoiners, we 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 want the truth to be out there, and we want people to understand the value that Bitcoin adds, and you know, not not have people so scared about uh, th these different type of flood that surrounds it. So. Um, we are, we're just getting this thing off the ground, very early stages, but yeah, we want to get out there talking to policymakers, uh, engaging staff of, um, of lawmakers to help, help them understand this, be a source to answer questions. A lot of times uh, with a lot of issues politicians face, they, 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 these, they're just people. They're not, you know, they're not experts on everything in the world, especially something new about blockchain. I would say the one great thing I heard Ted Cruz say recently, well, I mean, he had a lot of great things to say recently, but one thing that stood out was there's not five senators that yeah. could to tell you what Bitcoin is and they're out there, you know, voting on legislation. That's a problem. So there needs to be a resource that a politician, a lawmaker can call and say, hey, tell me a bit more about, tell me what is Bitcoin? Hey, what is Bitcoin mining? Hey, what, what are these type of risks with Bitcoin? So not, not saying that that, is, that that means they'll necessarily vote or advocate the way we want, but if we're a source of information, that goes a long way in helping set the record straight and help getting people making decisions uh, on a more informed basis. Yeah, I think it's critical. I mean, I think it's a it's a great thing to be doing and it, it's necessary. One thing I've noticed be, after getting into Bitcoin now, and I've really just focused on Bitcoin. And for me, primarily, it was because of I kind of entered in through the mining and the energy side of it. And so it was uh, understanding that first. And so to understand that, you kind of have to understand proof of work, like I mentioned earlier. So my very first, a lot of people, I think they just get exposed to it through whatever they you know hear about dogecoin or something and they start like getting into crypto and then they don't get it but for me i the angle that i came at it was from the energy side and then that made me dive into proof of work and then understanding uh, what was happening and so early on i kind of i had just the light came on and so then as i am talking to people about you know about bitcoin and what you know we're doing at our company and what you know i talk about with people on the podcast there's just so much uh people misunderstanding so much fud so many people wanting to either criticize or they're reading some headline that they that they read that's just completely inaccurate and you're just it can be borderline exhausting uh explaining to people and so i think that this effort that you're talking about is it's critical like i said and i've even tried to do it through the podcast having great conversations with people we're starting up in our city and i'm in oklahoma city we're going to do a monthly bitcoin meetup that i kind of am setting the first one up i'm going to try to keep that awesome. going monthly and have people just come and it's obviously the first ones will probably be people that that like Bitcoin or understand it, but I'm hoping to draw in other people, uh, even, you know, potentially even legislators or people in the community to come in and just learn and just hear people talk about it that are, that are passionate and knowledgeable. And I think that that has got to be the path forward to, to getting, to cutting through all the FUD basically. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And that's awesome what you're doing in Oklahoma city. I don't know if you knew riots. One of our, our, our first mining facility was located in Oklahoma city. I, I did know that it was crazy because yeah. like when I first heard about Riot, someone had mentioned that and they were like, weren't they like an Oklahoma City company? And I just was like, I, I didn't know that. But uh, it's interesting. Oklahoma has some really uh, some pretty cheap power. I think that we are behind in terms of we're obviously a lot smaller state than Texas, but we're behind in terms of the uh, of just the narrative battle. We need to embrace it more in the state. I know we've got a lot of cheap and, and underutilized energy. In fact, I, the other day, I think I mentioned this the last time we talked, but it was like I got a buddy that I know, and he made me aware of like a wind farm that's got like seventy-five megawatts. It's just curtailed. Like it's just. I think it's on the transmission side. I don't know the details behind it, but we have a ton of uh, a good energy mix in Oklahoma, and we have uh, excess energy. And I just think that it makes too much sense to uh, to mine Bitcoin here. I'm going to try to to make more of that happen. 
but uh, but we're you know we're just north of Texas and we need to catch up. I think. Yeah, yeah, I like. Well, yeah, you're right there. Easy for Bitcoin mining to start spilling over. It needs to a little bit. Um, so I want to talk more kind of technical because this is just me. Uh, I don't know if everybody will find it interesting. I kind of like to nerd out on some of this stuff, but I want to talk about the actual hardware. And you know, from what I've seen, you guys are using uh, S19s. Uh, and that looks to be the majority of what you have at the Windstone facility. Just your thoughts on a lot of the questions we get, because we work with a lot of uh, natural gas producers that are looking to mine Bitcoin. Some of these guys are using uh, the older generation machines because it's in the, you know, like S9s that are in the oil field. And they just, it's kind of, it's less expensive. It's still more profitable actually than selling natural gas, although gas has gone up lately. Uh, but as you look at that, the hardware technology into the future, are we going to continue to see these big leaps like at the next halving or whenever they release the next generation? And that's a tough question because uh, I don't think anybody truly knows, but just best guess estimates on, you know, where the terahash per second could go with the next gen. And then after that, let's talk about kind of efficiencies and how you see things evolving operationally. Yeah, I, I think so. First, um, Bitcoin mining hardware has kind of gotten this rep for historical reasons that it has this really low lifespan. Uh, people are thinking about ASICs and how they existed in 2014, and they're like, okay, you know, these things become, uh, um, they, they become old and uncompetitive after just obsolete after a few months or a year, and you got to keep upgrading. That was more of the case in the early stage of, of Bitcoin mining, the development of ASICs, and the advancement in hardware has definitely started to flatten out over time in terms of absolute improvements. Um, uh, I mean, there, there's still, you know, pretty strong relative improvements if you look at what the S9 to the S19 jump looks like, but, um, but the overall curve is slowing down and that's making capital expenses in the business a lot more feasible. Um, you talked about the S9. S9 probably, you know, one of the, if not the, most significant ASIC that's ever been developed. It was released in 2016. And as you just touched on, people are still using that today. So that, that's a five-year lifespan right. of the, uh, the, the market competitive uh, performance of that miner. That, 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 that's pretty incredible. Five years of that thing. Um, definitely a workhorse, definitely a beast. And I actually was just doing a uh, profitability calculator if you have a low enough energy cost, I mean, even if we pick the market medium, if you're all in uh, effective cost, uh, uh, including energy and operational expenses, was five cent a kilowatt hour, an S9 is still profitable for at least the next 12 months. Right. Yeah. And it's really incredible what happened in this market around the halving. The halving happened, so to the listeners don't know, when the uh, Every four years, the block reward for Bitcoin miners gets cut in half. This is what results in that limited supply of 21 million being essentially reached, uh, eventually reached, I should say. And in May of uh, 2020, we had the halving of the block reward. And the price did not go up so much around them. The price of Bitcoin kind of shot up to about 10,000 and went back down. The halving occurred, so uh, mining was, was reached this pretty low point in profitability. As a result, people were selling these S9s all over the place. They weren't competitive anymore. They wanted to get rid of them. They needed to buy new hardware to, to be competitive and get a good mining margin again. S9s were trading at, as people were selling S9s for $20 a unit, okay? Yeah. Now, the price of Bitcoin shot up so much, it kind of had that effect that it has historically had where in about the 12 months uh, or six to 12 months following the halving, the price starts to shoot up as that supply shock is realized. S9s were trading at $700 just a few months ago. Yeah. And I think that was eye-opening to a lot of people. And I think that's going to incentivize a lot of people to hold on to their hardware a bit more if something like that happens in the future um, because they might expect that same type of event occurs so that that uh, that 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 took place but you, um going back to the start of your question here yeah riot uses basically all s19s we bought a few thousand s17s uh back when that was the uh leading hardware on the market but all of our efforts have been focused on the s19 since then uh we have 
nearly 80,000 uh, S19s uh, either deployed or on order. So we're focusing on that. Those machines are performing very well, not only from a hash rate output perspective or efficiency perspective, but to me, one of the more important things is they're just robust machines. They're, they're not breaking as much. That they're, they're fulfilling the qualities that made the S9 so ideal. You run these things and they have been holding up very well. Very minimal failures out of the box. Uh, you know, if there are repair issues, they can uh, be dealt with. So I'm excited about that because I think when you combine that with the advancement in this hardware slowing down or flattening out, and um, the appreciation that we've seen in the price of Bitcoin lately, these machines should hopefully have a very long lifespan. You know, if the S9 lasted five years, it's effectively lasted five years so far, you, you, it seems very likely the S19 will meet or exceed that lifespan. So um, it, it, it's been a great investment uh, going into S19 so far. Riot was purchasing them at around 2200 a unit about a little over a year ago. Um, I wish we could go back to those prices now. Yeah. If you look at some of the most recent sales by industrial sized public miners, they're trading at six thousand a unit. And um, I, I know on you know on, on the on the uh, secondary market or on a more limited basis, the, these things are selling for over ten thousand. So right. um, definitely a, a a a land grab out there to get these machines uh, and get to, to get Bitcoin mining hash rate that can uh, last a long time. Got to get them. You got to plug them in too, though. Like yeah, you got to plug them in. Yeah. So first you get it, and you know. So I'd be, I'd be interested for you. So you got uh, M, you said micro BT, right? Yeah. I don't think you said what model. Yeah, I got an M30s uh, in okay. my house, and we're thinking about. I'm trying to get some M30s, the plus plus, or the ones that are the hundred. This is an 88 terahash. So okay. Um, so so e even a, a, in just one in your home on that limited basis. How did you? What was it? A, I mean, maybe your home was built, you know, already for with, with high. Uh, high amperage breakers, but like, was it a challenge for you to initially find some place to put it in? Did you have to upgrade anything? Yeah, it's funny that you, because earlier this reminds me, I wanted to talk about this and then I forgot. You said that there's no guidebook or playbook uh, to the large scale Bitcoin mining. There's like very little good content mm -hmm. around even just like home mining. And so I have just, it was like trial and error trying to get all the different things that I had to put together. I basically was trying to research like what power cord it, like I got it in the box and I'll <laughs> give a shout out to Compass Mining. I got it. Those guys have recently started kind of offering it for retail. And so I saw it and I was like, I'm going to get one of these. And uh, it didn't come with a power cord. And I was like, well, so that was one knock on Compass. Just at least give me the note that it didn't come with a power cord because I had to figure well, that, that, that out. That, that's very, that's very noise. No, it's not Compass. I mean, they will, go, they will come from Bitmain without power cords. Right. So yeah. I, I just didn't know. And so then I'm like Googling, you know, how to, what power cord and trying to figure it out. And they had like lead times on them because, you know, and you're like, I'm losing out on 35 bucks a day right now. Come on. And you're like trying to order like a power yeah. cord. But this is like a micro version of like what a large scale you know, like what you guys would go through when you're trying to ramp up a bigger facility. And so you're like, I didn't expect that. So that's a Ima you know, Imagine when that... you're trying to buy like 10,000 power cords. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so it's like this small version of it, but it's kind of the same gymnastics uh, you're having to go through. And so then it was like, all right, well, what kind of plug? And so I had to get an electrician to come out and do a drop at my house for a 240. And then it was like, okay. he's like, okay, I wanted it in my main garage. Uh, this is like a detached, I have like a detached garage that I made into like a man cave for the podcast studio that cool. I do these in. And so I was like, I wanted it in my main garage. And he's like, oh, that's going to be like, uh, I got to cut up through the ceiling. I got to cut over through this drywall and then I'm going to have to go through the attic and do this. And that's going to take me a week. And then that's going to be a thousand bucks. And I'm like, and then I was like, well, what about laying the line through the yard over these? Like, that'll be two grand. And I got I might have to dig up your sprinkler system. So again, it gets back to like this thing where you're like, I thought this was just going to be easy. I could just plug this in, get an electrician to come over. Next thing I know, I'm like, how much to just put it right here next to the breaker box? He's like 300 bucks. And I was like, all right, just, just do that. <laughs> and so it's like, cause you know, you're doing the math and you're like, well, I'm losing 35 bucks a day. I'm yeah. not net, but gross. And then you're like, um, you know, I got to pay this other, you know, yeah, I've got to pay this money to get this other thing done. And then it's like, there's no, there was really no good, uh, you know, you have to find the IP address, get into the hardware, then, you know, go to the pool and get your, I mean, you just have to set it all up and there's just not a great source out there uh, for just like a one-stop shop for home mining. So I've made it like a, I haven't, I want to do like some content just around helping somebody try to set one up at their house. I don't have, I've had run out of time to do that, but I just think it's like, that's a small version of just trying to plug one in mm -hmm. at your home, uh, let alone 80,000 or whatever you just said earlier. 
Yeah, and you know, so you're you're talking about uh, made, made me think of another point. You know, so when you're deploying, you are making you're trying to make it work in an existing structure. Right. So a lot of times, uh, so that's what we call like brownfield development sites, something that already exists that's being retrofitted to go into Bitcoin mining, and that introduces a lot of challenges because you're dealing. Oftentimes, people are finding these warehouse warehouses or industrial structures that are how many decades old, and now right. they're you know need to reconfigure it, get everything working right for Bitcoin mining, and that's hard enough as it is. And I think most of the brownfield sites for Bitcoin mining, if, if maybe all have been secured already. Like if there's a good opportunity to take some large industrial building and turn it into Bitcoin mining, I think all of those opportunities have already been realized. So now it's a matter of kind of building from scratch, which is even harder. You're taking dirt and you're making it into, into a Bitcoin mine. So it's yeah. definitely, I think, making the industry more competitive. And I think it's introducing um, a lot of challenges that people haven't considered. You, you talked about this miners making $35 a day and how frustrating it is when they're not turned on. I, right. I, I, I know what that's like. It's just unbelievable. You're sitting there and you're like, we just need these things on ASAP. Come on. Yeah. And the if people who don't know, these miners are priced around the assumption that they're going to be turned on when received. They're yeah. priced on an expected return on investment period. The calculation is kind of a black box, but that is what is driving the market prices for these miners. So it, it is... It is really huge for your profitability and your ROI when you are sitting with that machine and it's not being turned on. So all of that to said, I think there. Um, my point here is, I think there's a lot of miners out there that have been buying a lot of miners and not thinking about this next important step to turn them on. And I think we're going to start seeing a lot of miners sitting on pallets in the coming months and people pretty frustrated they're not able to turn them on. Yeah. Hundred percent, and I think that that's we've also been focusing on like uh, just oil field and kind of this distributed data centers, and there's a bunch of other companies out there doing it, like Gam or Caruso or uh, you know a group that we uh, work with on the data center side, like Upstream Data. They do a great job building these different sizes. I call them hash huts, and it's interesting because yes, it is a smaller scale, but it's a pretty easy to get generators, and you can get you can spool up like fairly quickly if you have the natural gas you can or even if you're on the grid you can use these things uh and you can spool up you know 10 20 megawatt type deployments uh in relatively short order you don't need the transformers it's more distributed uh there's some other things to think about i mean you got security you've got uh, the elements right it's like we were looking at a site the other day and they're like well you know one time it like flooded three and a half feet at this site. And you're like, ah, it's not good. You're like, can we put this on stilts? Like, can we put it on? Like, can we like, like lay some dirt? So it's just like, but it's, we're talking about proof of work though. Like what we yeah. talked about earlier, it's like, how do you, there's so much thought and effort that goes into doing this beyond just like the power consumption. And so I just think it's a fascinating uh, part of the reason why I want to do the content around it is it's just extremely fascinating to me. I've just spent my career at kind of the intersection between like energy and, and value and when I found out this was like the highest use case value use case for energy, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. And so to talk to transition to more of kind of like the economics of mining and looking at, you know, historically the difficulty rate increasing and, you know, it's been fairly steep. I mean, if you look at the, at the averages of it, it's uh, per month, it's high. Maybe that's flattening out. You know, this is kind of a debate point we have when we look at like, you know, projecting economics, but, and sometimes we'll boil it to like the hash price. I don't know if you ever look at that, but mm -hmm. basically it's like, can we continue to, uh, can, you know, can we continue to be profitable? I mean, obviously it has to, Bitcoin price just has to go up at a faster rate uh, than the difficulties going up if you just want to talk about it really simply. And so how do you guys just think about, uh, you know, projecting into the future, you know, the difficulty rate or in some, maybe this is don't say anything. You can't, obviously you're CEO of a, of a public company. So you, you, have to, you probably have guidance and things like that, but just how do you think about projecting these economics and will Bitcoin price continue to outpace, uh, you know, the difficulty rate? Yeah. Modeling in Bitcoin mining is such a challenge. It's, um, yeah, it's because tough. yeah, you got, you got these two, super unpredictable factors. First off, the price of Bitcoin, who, you know, has clearly trended up um, for its lifespan. And I, you know, fully expect as a huge believer in Bitcoin, that, that trend is going to continue, but very volatile over the short term and medium term, you know, 12, 24 months periods, uh, you can see 80% or, or even more swings. 
So um, you got that one variable that's all over the place. And then two, you have that network difficulty, which is driven by what the total Bitcoin mining network hash rate is. And while that tends to be connected to the price of Bitcoin, it, 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 trends, it tends to trend to be with the price of Bitcoin over time, but it can detach in a really big way over the short term. Right. I think one of the best examples of, of that is you look back in 2017, Price of Bitcoin shot up starting the year around 700, shot up to 20,000. Over the course of the year, everyone's buying Bitcoin mining hardware. Everyone's loading up. Uh, they see the huge margins. They're super excited. Well, thing is, you order that and when you start building. It's about you know eight, 12 months before that stuff really comes online. And the phenomenon we saw was when the price started correcting from 20,000 and going down, the difficulty was going up as these miners started coming online. And that's that, not that, what you that want. really, what's that's that? Not, that's not what you want. That's They're not what you want. So that, 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 that was a real squeeze on, on, on mining margins. Um, so you know, just using that as an example of how those two things, well, they should be intertwined because you think there's more competition around Bitcoin mining when the price is going up and there's opportunity, it can become very detached over short and medium periods. Um, that's why OPEX is so important, right? Like why you're- that, Yeah, that's cost. why OPEX is very important. You need that very competitive cost so you can survive those downturns, right? You know, we, we lived through those downturns and we saw what type of prices and what type of operational expenses uh, would really push the limit to what break even was. And uh, you don't you don't want to be in that position. You, know, you want to continue to always drive good financial results and you want to be in a position to always be able to upgrade your fleet, you know, or expand when opportunities come there in the future. And if you're making zero dollars, uh, it's very difficult to do that. So, um, but getting back to your question, how you kind of look at this, what, what's been great to see is the growing amount of third party resources that try to project this stuff. So to, I think more, um, more important than price, I think, really is the network difficulty, the network hash rate. And there's groups like BitUda who put out pretty regular research on the information they've gathered and what they project as the network hash rate going forward. And that alone will give you a tool for you to estimate what your Bitcoin denominated revenue is. And if you know if the projection, um, if reality meets projection, then you're going to be pretty good at, and your deployment meets your projection, you're going to be pretty good at predicting what your Bitcoin denominated revenue is. Um, so I think their report is, so right now the network hash rate is about, global network hash rate is about 160 exahash. They project it'll reach 200 by the end of the year and 340, I believe, by the end of 2022. So if you're looking to, you know, to model at least 12, 14 months out, you have that kind of pretty probably reliable uh, resource to work off of. So that's what we try to focus on because we're a Bitcoin company. We are trying to accumulate Bitcoin through mining. Then if you want to look at what the dollar results are going to be, then you've got to start trying to estimate the price, which is, which is, a, which is a whole can of worms. Right. Um, so I think we usually just try to be, for our own internal use, you know, we, we don't issue guidance or projections right now. But if we're just kind of internally thinking about what should the dollar denominated return be, um, we, we tend to be very, very conservative on the, the price estimates. Uh, just, you know, for the sake of being conservative in modeling. Right. You have to be. So what you talked about was just to, to mine. You said this a few times, which is to mine Bitcoin and to hold uh, to accumulate Bitcoin. And so I've heard people, uh, you know, call this the HODL ratio. And if you look at it and we've as we've looked at it, especially in the context of the oil and gas industry, where people may not, you know, be believers in Bitcoin, they may not uh, know much about it. All they see, and they want to convert everything to like MCF, right? Or to kilowatt hour or something, you know? So it's like, they're just looking at this margin and you know, here, here's what I can make. And I could turn it into dollars right today and lock that in. But then, you know, as somebody that kind of believes in the long-term uh, trajectory of Bitcoin and what, you know, what's happening in the world with it, you start to say, I don't really want to sell any of this. I want to have a hot ratio of as high as I can get. And there's things like, you know, OPEX and taxes and other stuff that, uh, that are involved, but like, how do you guys view uh, you just holding Bitcoin? Is that the ultimate goal is to just like, hey, look, if we hodl and we can have a really low OPEX, like long term, like this is going to pan out. I mean, I know that's just like a really simple thing to way to think about it, but that's kind of how I think about it. 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, it, historically holding on to Bitcoin has been a good investment um, uh, over you know over the lifetime over its lifetime. Bitcoin has gone from zero dollars to now sixty two thousand or very volatile today. Let's say sixty one thousand. Uh, so you know we are believers in the future of Bitcoin, and we want to hold on to as much Bitcoin as possible. So through uh, this year, through all you know, our financial results that we've been releasing, uh, we haven't sold Bitcoin. Uh, we've been holding onto the Bitcoin that we mine. We, you know, you, typically that can get pretty expensive because you know energy is it's a major cost. To your production here, you still have to pay these power bills no matter what. Right. Um, Riot has, you know, we have a very efficient access to capital through public markets, so. We've re- re- historically uh, built up our balance sheet with equity financing and been able to build, pay expenses out of that and not be forced to sell our Bitcoin. Now, what's also kind of interesting is with the acquisition of Winstone, we not only got this facility and capacity for expansion, we also now have a hosting business where we host a number of institutional Bitcoin mining clients there and they pay us a fee for hosting them there. Yeah. So one um, longer term tool we're not up there yet, but a place that I think we'd like to get to is having that hosting revenue uh, pay our self-mining expenses. And then uh, we would know in that case, we would no longer be relying on outside financing to have a hollow ratio. Like, you know, like you talked about of 100 percent, we could then, you know, ha- have the, the self-mining business. I'm sorry, the hosting side of the business be able to sufficiently uh, finance the self-mining side of the business. So. Um, like I said, that is not where we're at right now, but that is something we're thinking about as a tool to be trying to hold on to as much Bitcoin as we possibly can. Yeah, I really like that. And that's uh, kind of leading into the next one of the next questions, and I'll relate it to what my company has been doing. So we've got an advisory business where we advise on energy producers, uh, stakeholders, investors, midstream companies, and we uh, do a lot of different things. We have an energy marketing business as well. But we have the ability to build these different platforms of uh, of revenue generation and that's been really powerful because maybe something's not doing as good and then the other one's doing better and it's just good to be diversified. And so when we think about the Bitcoin space, we are positioning ourselves to have uh, to have our advisory business uh, really focus in on helping uh, right now, at least primarily oil and gas producers uh, kind of turnkey understand and spool up if they want to their own Bitcoin mining operation, whether it be through disadvantaged, stranded, flared gas or whatever, maybe even sales gas, to be honest. I mean, some guys are looking at just like, hey, I should allocate a portion of this to Bitcoin. And so we have that, but we're also looking at, uh, at mining as well and have some small, relatively small deployments that we hope to announce uh, here uh, by the end of the year. But as we think about this, it's like if you can build up a platform where you have uh, some revenue sources that are in the Bitcoin eco, it, this kind of this ecosystem around Bitcoin, maybe that can help support uh, to where you didn't, don't have to be selling all the Bitcoin uh, if you are going to mine, because I do believe that uh, the holding it strategy long term is going to generate over a five year or longer look, probably the best returns. And so um, this is all leading to where as a Bitcoin miner at the scale that you guys have, I mean, we're talking about a very, um, with what we're doing is very small scale, but with what you guys have, do you see Bitcoin miners evolving into uh, these other things? Like you said, hosting. I mean, I've heard some guys say that, uh, you know, and this may sound radical to some, but they've said that like Bitcoin mining miners may be kind of like these future financial institutions uh, where you're using your Bitcoin uh, to do other things, whether that be uh, to, to lend or to it's almost like a bank because you're the ones generating uh, this reserve currency. And so do you think that in the future, it sounds like you do where Riot is has some other income generating things that then let you uh, focus on Bitcoin mining is kind of uh, is almost like the core thing, but you don't have to sell. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have any definitive plans about that, but I'll tell you, you know, personally, conceptually, I, I agree that um, any time in life you have a large pool of capital, there is a lot of interesting things you can do with that, particularly when we're talking about the most sound money that has ever existed right. and potentially, you know, the, the uh, I should say, hopefully, the world's next reserve currency. So I think yeah. those long-term holders of Bitcoin are going to have opportunities for themselves in the future. Can't really say what they're going to be, what they're going to look like yet. But you talk about lending, you talk about yield generation, we're, we're starting to see the emergence of those products now. So yeah, I, I'm excited. I, I think there are things that uh, holders of Bitcoin are going to be able to use to put their Bitcoin to work in the future. 
Um, I, th- I think it is, you know, talking, uh, stepping a bit back again to this hodling topic. Um, it's really interesting to see how so many miners are holding on to Bitcoin now and the effect that it's having on circulated supply. Right. Um, there are 900 Bitcoin, approximately 900 Bitcoin that are mined each day. That's, you know, there's, there's some variance to that, but based on the expected su- the supply schedule and the expected amount of blocks each day, that is all the Bitcoin that's being mined each day. Riot mined 406 Bitcoin in September. So I, I just say that to put that 900 day in perspective, like that's just one miner right. and that, that Bitcoin is not in the market. And there's some uh, really interesting blockchain analysis people can do because Bitcoin is so transparent. They can look at all the Bitcoin that has been mined and they can look at if that Bitcoin moves or not. And there's been a growing trend of that Bitcoin not moving, which means, which means not only is the new supply of Bitcoin being halved every uh, every four years. But now these institutions, especially, you know, forget me talking about Riot mining 406, 406 Bitcoin in a month. How about MicroStrategy accumulating some 120,000 Bitcoin that they're never letting go of? So there's a lot of supply that is coming out of the market. And that is going to make Bitcoin more and more scarce, which should you know theoretically drive up the value more and more and uh, further... Um, uh, uh, Further capitalizes kind of the idea that we're talking about here that, you know, in the future, the holders of Bitcoin are going to kind of own uh, a significant amount of, amount of the world's capital. Yeah, it's cool to think about. I, you know, the other day I had like a tweet and it like had a bunch of likes and it was I don't know if this is a true stat. But someone said that like in, you know, two hundred thousand dollars a coin, uh, like half the world's billionaires will be. Bitcoiners, and I think that that was quoted in a Bloomberg article. I had a lot of people on Twitter say that's not true. It's going to be less than that. But regardless, if it's half or if it's 10%, it is a massive wealth creation that's happening. And a lot of the people that are accumulating it at that level, I don't think they're going to, I mean, maybe they'll sell some at 200, but I think a lot of people see the horizon of where it can go into the future. And there's just this, I mean, even me, like personally, people ask me about it. It's like, oh, if it gets to this price, like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I'm hopeful that I can have it as like a retirement or like for my child, you know, when you really start to understand the scarcity of it, uh, it's like that Michael Saylor quote where he's like, uh, you know, he like wakes up every night or something and like talks about how he's afraid that he doesn't have enough or whatever. I don't know if you've seen that quote. <laughs> he he's, like, he, <laughs> he's like, once I figured this out, he's like, I woke up every night and was worried that someone else would figure it out and I wouldn't be able to buy enough or something. But this is a pretty incredible quote. But, uh, you know, I think that that plays into kind of the last uh, set of things I want to talk about, which is just the macro backdrop of everything that's going on. I mean, I just can't imagine. There's so many easy things to attack Bitcoin about. And by easy, I mean lazy, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that it's getting harder and harder uh, the more educated people get and then the more mainstream adoption, knowing that even like the major banking institutions have really just barely started dipping their toes into this space. Uh, just your thoughts in general about uh, everything that's going on macro. I know that's a broad question, but uh, spoiler alert, I feel like it's very bullish. Yeah, I mean, I, I cannot believe the amount of macro events that have taken place over the past uh, 12, 18 months that have so clearly demonstrated the use case for Bitcoin and why it's valuable and why we need a Bitcoin future. And I do think people are waking up to that in a, in a, in a fast way. And I think that's what's contributed to the, uh, it's been a large contributor to the price appreciation over that same time period. So it really sometimes takes like, it takes these big events for people to kind of to kind of get it. You know, when, when life's going smoothly, everything's going great. There's no real apparent uh, major macroeconomic problems. Um, people, it's harder for them to realize what the use case for Bitcoin is. You know, someone asked me recently, what is the bear case for Bitcoin? And it's kind of a tough question for someone as bullish as me. But the, the answer that I arrived at was, that the public will not accurately perceive the damaging effects of inflation. The Mm -hmm. inflation will continue at a rapid rate and those damaging effects will continue. To me, that that is an absolute certainty. And the risk is the public is not able to perceive that or is convinced it's not a problem. And that, um, I I think eventually that the pot boils over, but it it could be a misconception that perceived for some time and the full value of Bitcoin isn't realized. But, you know, like I said, from what we've seen take place over the last 18 months, p- 
people are, are really starting to get it. And even with the level of adoption that we're seeing, I still feel like Bitcoin is in its early stages. Um, it's not something that is still easy enough for most people to accumulate and hold. I mean, I think that's why there's a lot of interest around things like an ETF, because most people, um, especially maybe older generations, don't want to deal with the friction and security risk of buying Bitcoin on an exchange or setting up a hardware wallet the way I would you know, recommend people buy Bitcoin. Right. So they want to use an instrument that they're used to, and that's you know, legacy markets, trading, trading an ETF. Um, so, I mean, I just use that as one example of how I you know, still believe we're early. There's still people out there that think Bitcoin is a scam or Bitcoin is worthless and we're all just uh, delusional. And it, it, it is becoming mainstream, but I think it is a far away from full mainstream yet. And that's what makes me very excited about the future opportunity of Bitcoin. Absolutely. So we're running out of time. Last question, and this is something that I think plays very well into what you just said. And that is this kind of moral case for and not just a bullish case for, you know, all these banks jumping in or institutions, but really more of a moral case. And people will say Bitcoin has no use value. There's no intrinsic value. It's just, you know, they, they want to criticize it. They say it's a waste of energy. And I think that and I and I don't like I don't love the word privilege, but I think that this is a good example of we live. Most people that I know live in a Western economy and you can go and open a bank account. And, uh, and it's easy, right? It's very frictionless to just uh, be able to control your money and to do these things. And there are vast swaths, you know, probably in the billions of people, uh, if I had a guess, that don't have that luxury. And so to me, I think the moral case is pretty clear. But like, if you had to say uh, kind of what your thoughts are on the good that this will bring, uh, just kind of final, final question, uh, just give me your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I think the most important point to me is Bitcoin gives the individual sovereign control of their wealth from two perspectives. One, you own it. No one can take it. No one can move it. If you are storing Bitcoin, uh, utilizing its, the full extent of its properties, you own that and no one can ever take that away from you. You can hold the key to move your Bitcoin in your head. No one can read your thoughts. That Bitcoin, it, it cannot be seized from you. I think that's a very important moral point. And I, I think, you know, further the, the sound money nature of Bitcoin and the fact that it cannot be the value of it cannot be inflated away like fiat currency. I think that's an important part of having sovereign control of your wealth as well. You own something that has a fixed supply that no one can change your uh, ratio to ownership of. So um, I, I, I agree with you on the concept of people are, in the Western world are often so privileged uh, or privileged enough, I should say, maybe that they don't perceive why that's valuable. Um, but I think it's I think macro events are making that more and more clear. You know, how much does your Thanksgiving dinner cost this year compared to right. the last year? You know, how, what's it like trying to go buy a used car right now? That's how long is it taking you to get basic materials delivered to you? This is the result of a fiat world and a currency that has run out of control. And Bitcoin is fixed. Bitcoin is the answer to that problem. Couldn't have said it better. Jason, thanks so much for taking time. I know you're a busy guy and I really do appreciate it. Uh, it means a lot to come on the podcast and I'm excited to see what Riot does into the future. And uh, if there's anything that I can do to help, whether it be on the advocacy stuff, I know Tristina will let me know. And I, I just thank you guys for uh, reaching out and you taking the time. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on, Max. And uh, it was a good chat.